Something to Chew On is a podcast devoted to the exploration and discussion of global food systems. It's produced by the Office of Research Development at Kansas State University. I'm Jay Weeks, PhD candidate in the Department of Agronomy. My co-host is Scott Zanona, an associate professor in the Department of Philosophy who specializes in the philosophy of science. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. We've got a great interview for you today with Dr. Jesse Vipham. Jesse is a microbiologist by training, focusing on food safety and currently serves as the faculty hire in Global Food Systems and Nutrition for the USAID Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Collaborative Research on Sustainable Intensification here at K-State. We covered a lot of ground in this conversation, starting with Jesse's graduate work using direct-fed microbials and cattle systems, and then moved on to the work she does now managing food safety projects in several developing countries around Africa and Southeast Asia. Jesse is a brilliant, thoughtful lady. I really appreciated her perspectives on things like how to tackle large, challenging issues related to food systems, the importance of trust in the success of any major project, uh, and the benefits of bi-directional learning for countries like the United States that are invested in international development. This intro doesn't even begin to do the full conversation justice. I have no doubts that this will be one you'll enjoy. We're happy today to be interviewing uh, Dr. Jesse Vipham. Welcome, Jesse. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. So I will have introduced you briefly uh, in the intro before starting this, uh, but uh, we'd like to have you describe yourself a little bit and your background and how you got to where you are today. Okay, that's easy enough. Well, I am trained as a food microbiologist, so a lot of my background is in food microbiology, food safety training. I have my PhD from Texas Tech University, as well as my master's degree. Um, my bachelor's degree is actually from Kansas State, so being here on faculty is a little bit of a homecoming. It's nice to be back in Manhattan. Cool. I was raised on a, a registered Angus cattle ranch in northeastern Nevada, so I've been involved in agriculture and agriculture pursuits most of my life. Um, food safety, food microbiology felt like an opportunity for me to remain in that environment while also getting a chance to kind of move into more laboratory-based sciences. And so that's been a really nice career choice for me because it's kept me with my roots but also allowed me to do some different things. Um, I'm currently involved in the USAID Future Feed the Future Innovation Labs here on campus. So my position has moved me a little bit out of domestic food safety and into international food safety. And so I do research mainly in Southeast Asia and Africa on food safety questions, as well as food systems questions, agriculture production questions. So that's currently where I'm spending most of my time. Great. Yeah, uh, we want to get into to all of that throughout the conversation, <laughs> obviously. Uh, was there something about microbiology uh, when you were younger that, that really fueled your interest? Uh, what was it about the lab work? So actually, I didn't fall in love with microbiology until I got to my master's degree. My background uh, from my bachelor's degree is ag econ. And so I, uh, I remember so vividly, I was walking across campus. It was getting super close to graduation. And I was thinking to myself, oh my goodness, what am I going to do with my life? And I decided I was going to go to get my master, master's degree in meat science. I don't know where that came from, but I went over and spoke to Dr. Melvin Hunt. And he said, yeah, you should check out Kansas, uh, Texas Tech. And that's what led me there. And actually, Dr. Mindy Brashears uh, is who I got engaged with there. And she's a food microbiologist. I started spending time with her, and I realized that... You know, microbiology is super cool because there's a lot of questions that are left unanswered in that science. And it's a very investigative um, type of, of research because you can't see what's happening. And so you have to sort of go through a lot of critical thinking to try and identify, okay, what's the best way to test what we need to test? And then how can we use what we know about the discipline to, to lead us to our conclusions because we can't see what's happening. So we get to do this really cool lab-based stuff and, and then there's just this interesting investigative and in evolving piece that comes with, with microbiology that I love. It's kind of like a puzzle, right? It is a puzzle. 
it's it's such a people sometimes think about science so much as about sort of you know the observable things right mm-hmm. sort of the directly testable things and I don't think they quite realize how much in fact I mean it's not guesswork but you're making all these inferences about exactly right. what you said things that you can't see right it's a, absolutely it's, it's a it's a neat endeavor but complicated right well and when you take something like microbiology and you apply it to something like a food system the complexity just becomes more interesting because you are moving from, okay, we have these complex things that we're trying to understand about these microorganisms, but the food system in itself is a complex evolving you know, situation. And so how you, do you get bored in that <laughs> environment? I mean, right. I think it would sure. be really hard to. So, so that's, I guess, why I'm into it and, and like it. So are there things that you were working on uh, in the master's and then sort of early uh, in getting your PhD that you're still working on now, or have you kind of shifted away from from some of the earlier work? Yes and no. So my uh, thesis and dissertation research was really based in more domestic food safety questions. Um, like I said, I'm from a cattle background, so I'm really interested in the, the beef industry, kind of, you know, that just feels very comf- comf- comfortable <laughs> for me. And um, that's where I spent a lot of my time. But during that time, um, Dr. Brashear spends a lot of her time in um, Central America doing research for food safety there. So Honduras, Mexico, um, she's done some different stuff in uh, Panama. So she's really engaged in food security style research. And I got to be involved in that, although it wasn't directly any of the projects I was doing. And um, I think that that's where I kind of caught the bug for that recognition of, you know, in domestic food safety, there's a lot to be done, but you're sort of moving a needle just a bit Mm -hmm. by bit. You're making a really good system just that much better Mm -hmm. versus there's all this space for improvement, particularly when you're talking about developing nations. So that, I think, just felt really exciting to me to go into a space where people weren't really doing research and there was a lot of room to move um, versus kind of trying to, you know, pick away at, at important questions, but maybe not as um, uh, big of questions. Right. So the possibility less. for a bigger impact was, yeah, uh, was greater than for you. Yeah, absolutely. And they're, they're, you know, both domestic and international food safety research is super important and super valid. Sure. I just became a little more interested in the international mm-hmm. side. So before we get to the international stuff, your, your PhD dissertation title was Reduced Burden Characterization in <laughs> RNA Gene Expression of Salmonella and Bovine Sibiliac Sibiliac <laughs> Lymph Nodes Associated with Administration of Direct-Fed Microbials. I uh, don't know that anyone's ever read that. That <laughs> 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 will be broadcast to all our listeners. Uh, but my question is, uh, with the direct-fed microbial, mm-hmm. I mean, were you was that like a probiotic sort of thing? Uh, and what are your views on the kind of in the building industry around probiotics and that. So yes, so a direct fed microbial would be a probiotic for animal use. Okay. So probiotics are for human use. That that would be where that name would apply. Sure. And then direct fed microbials apply to animal feeds. So same thing, but it's we, we have it kind of categorized differently. Um, so what the question that really came up during the time that I was in my dissertation was this question around the harbridge of salmonella and E. coli in bovine lymph nodes. And there's a lot of lymph nodes within, you know, a a carcass, and it's really challenging to remove all of those. And so for the most part, they end up being part of ground beef. It's totally fine. It's totally safe. Um, But that there is this opportunity for pathogens to sort of evade the, the typical interventions that we have within beef slaughter to, you know, show up in ground product. And so that was a big question that a lot of researchers that are involved in beef safety were investigating at that time. And so Dr. Brashears and Dr. Guy Lonergan, um, who is also at Texas Tech, they had done a lot of research on, on these direct-fed microbials um, f- as far as pathogen shedding in, in feedlot cattle and thought that, hey, you know, maybe there's something going on that's, you know, more systemic than just, you know, through through the shedding in, in, in fecal matter. And so that's where that dissertation came up. Okay. Um, I think that there's a lot of promise to direct fed microbials, but I think that what, what 
this conversation that I would like to take advantage of a little bit is that there's a lot of value in food safety to what we call multi-hurdle intervention approaches. And so I think where direct fed microbials come into play is that it's a a way to sort of, from a pre-harvest on-farm perspective, begin to start paying attention to food safety issues, whether we realize it or not. And there's a so you mean before it gets to the slaughterhouse before, and sort of think yeah, about before, it ahead of time, right? Before yeah. you know, we get into a situation where we're bringing large loads of pathogens potentially into a slaughter facility, is there anything we can do on the farm or at the feedlot level that has an impact on that? And it also just so happens that direct fed microbials help you know, with cattle growth. So you can actually see benefit in feeding that um, from their growth perspective. And so it was, it's kind of a win-win, and, and like I said, I think it's a really nice proactive way to begin working on food safety before we're trying to clean it up, you know, right before the consumer buys it or something along that line. And that's, you know, that's a very typical practice that we see in, in U.S. as well as European and, you know, other food safety systems around the world, this sort of multi-hurdle value chain approach to food safety. So when you say multi-hurdle, you mean? So it's kind of that concept of, you know, if you have someone running down the track and you have a bunch of hurdles, hopefully eventually you'll trip them up, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> and yeah. so, so the purpose is, is that if you have an intervention alo- you know, at certain points along um, a value chain, And hopefully it's a strategic position that you're putting that intervention in. So where there's potential for contamination, you're you're hopefully reducing either the presence or the the concentration of, of pathogens as they move through that chain. And we have lots of points of contamination where. You know, a product can be safe until that point of contamination. Mm-hmm. We can clean it up, and then there might be also more points of contamination as we move through that chain. So having interventions throughout that space can really help us to ensure that food safety is a part of, of what we're doing as we produce. The regular food. practice throughout. You don't have throughout. to rely on any particular point sort of mm-hmm. to totally take care of it, right? Sort of, but you're hoping, yeah, multiple. Well, and it's, it's also a little bit of that, you know, it's easier for a lot of people to carry a big load than just mm-hmm. one person. And so how do you kind of get an entire value chain um, from a food production standpoint to say, okay, we're going to, you know, we are playing our part in reducing the the chances of of bacterial pathogens getting to the food supply. And we're hoping that others along the way will too. The other big thing that people, the public hears about is antibiotic use, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you, how does the um, feeding cattle, uh, the microbes, right? So basically the probiotics sort Mm -hmm. of, how does that mesh with that? Is this an alternative or is it sort of to work with it or, or how does that, how does that work? So I think that that's a really great question, and we spend a lot of time really focusing on antimicrobial resistance um, from a food safety perspective. I won't comment too heavily on that area because I don't spend a lot of time. That's not my expertise. Sure. Um, And so I would probably inevitably... Out, you know, speak out of turn, yeah. and so I think. There, but there are some really fantastic researchers at Kansas State who are looking into those things. Um, Dr. Apley in the vet school would be, you know, one of probably the top people. Um, but I, I do think that from a food system perspective, we are always attempting to find alternatives, and that's not necessarily saying because we want to stop using something eventually, but there's there's definitely context in which certain interventions or certain applications have, you know, more, they're, they're better suited for that situation or that context. And so I think providing the food industry with as many different tools as possible is always a valuable pursuit. And I think that that there's lots of science being done in order to try and identify, you know, what are some of the different strategies that we can use and and give options to people, as well as I think, you know, try to be forward thinking and attempt to say, okay, how do we see changes in the food supply impacting what we're doing now and vice versa. And so I think that that's what I would say from a probiotic or direct fed microbial perspective. I think it's just another tool that can be used to to help to support the the health and the safety of our food. 
farmers are incentivized because of the faster growth rates and the better health of the cattle and things like that overall, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know that it, it it comes down to just that, but there definitely is a dual purpose there. Sure. And so, you know, the direct fed microbials, it, there's data that is published that shows that, you know, it it's, a, you know, a good product to feed. And honestly, quite a f- it's it's pretty standard practice. I mean, I oh, think... Oh, so most farmers are doing this now? Well, not necessarily farmers, but from a feedlot perspective, a feedlot it would be, that. you'd be hard pressed to find um, feeders that are not incorporating some form of a direct fed microbial or ionophore or something like that in into the feeds that they're feeding so as the, part of the diet. Are they just like powders that get blended in or how, <laughs> what does that look like? Or is it... All kinds of stuff. So a direct fed microbial is actually a culture. And so you would have some type of usually lactic acid bacteria is is what um, gets incorporated. So it would be actual live culture. Okay. Fascinating. How long has this been, uh, you know, a technology or tool that's being used sort of semi-commonly? I mean, it's, it's, it's a pretty common technology. So... You know, uh, I, w- I would I would speak incorrectly. Yeah, I think, sure. If, sure. If I just, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, at it, for yeah. at least you know, since I was doing yeah, been my while. dissertation yeah. <laughs> work <laughs> yeah, and right. before that, right, right. so I mean, it's been around for okay. for quite some time. And there's been a lot of research that's gone into really identifying you know what are the specific strains that should be used um, from a direct fed microbial standpoint. If you jump into probiotics, you know, probiotic use has been around for. Like forever, I mean, right? For a very, very long time. Right. Right. Foods, right. Right. So yeah, yeah, fermented right. foods, all right. of that, you know, have a a some form of uh, you know probiotic involved. Right, right, and it's a like what last couple of decades or something, right? Sort of a fad in terms of human food now, right? You know, right. But, yeah. Well, it, within our culture, right. you know, I think right. there's a right. lot right. of cultures right. that you can find. Yeah, good point. So I just got back from Ethiopia and, you know, one of the super common foods that they, I mean, it's not even common. I mean, it, it's the staple food is injera, which is a fermented teff product, usually sometimes wheat, and they make kind of a bread out of it. And they consume that with absolutely every meal. And, and that's been you know, what their culture has done for probably longer than our culture has been around. So, (laughs) yeah, well, I just, I'm sorry. I had to ask you about that because I'm fascinated by the the microbiome stuff and all that work that's coming out now. So I wanted to get your take on. Well, well, thanks. Uh, Well, (laughs) Well, no, I I just, you know, I I think that that is a a super interesting area as well. And so, but, uh, you know, I always try to say, you know, and, and reiterate, you know, it's a tool. And, and there's lots of other really great things that, that can be used out there from, from an intervention perspective. So. so, you know, one of the main reasons we wanted to talk to you is your work with the international work, as you alluded to before. So uh, you work for the USAID Feed the Future Innovation Lab, or one of them here on campus. Yes, yeah. and with the Sustainable Intensification Innovation Lab. Um, so I guess just to start out, what are the, the USAID uh, Feed the Future Labs? Okay, so um, the Feed the Future program is an arm of USAID. Um, and so really that arm is probably the, the smaller arm when you really look at their entire portfolio. And it's specifically designed to do, it's, it's a research for development arm. And so it's designed to engage with U.S universities in order to create research projects to uh, to investigate certain questions that kind of perpetuate issues in food systems around the world. And so uh, we currently have four of those labs. I think there's like 26 of them total, 24 of them, something like that. And they're, they're scattered around the United States. Certain universities have multiple. Other universities have, you know, one. And, and they are targeting either specific value chains or targeting certain concepts that apply to certain value chains. So a concept-based lab would be like the Sustainable Intensification Innovation Lab. So it's more of, you know, the concepts around sustainable intensification as they apply to agriculture production, food production, 
versus the sorghum and millet innovation lab that we have here is is focusing on how do we see improvements in sorghum and millet within the target countries. Right. And, I, and I wanted to ask, when you said value chain, that's what you mean, a particular product or, right? Yes. Yeah, right, so, right. Sorry, I didn't really yeah. define no, 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 that's that cool. as we, we've yeah. talked a lot yeah. about value yeah. chains. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. So a value chain would really be, you know, how does a certain product like sorghum or wheat, um, meat, milk, move from farm all the way into a consumer's home? So uh, specifically, what does the Sustainable Intensification Innovation Lab do? Uh, and I guess more broadly, how do you define sustainable, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's a word that gets thrown around a lot. Yes, and uh, it's not. that's not the first time anyone's ever <laughs> asked me that question. So really what the Sustainable Intensification Innovation Lab is focusing on and, and the definition of sustainable intensification is how do you keep up the level of production uh, from an agriculture perspective, or at least, you know, keep it up or increase your productivity without increasing the amount of land and resources that you're using to do that. And so it's really looking at, you know, as we move forward, we're not getting more land and we're probably not getting more resources. And so how do we conserve the resources that we have while also maintaining really productive food production because the population is going to increase as that those constraints on the resources continue to happen. And so that's really what Sustainable Intensification Innovation Lab is looking to do. And so we've got different types of sustainable intensification projects happening all across the world. We have six target countries, um, two in West Africa, which are Senegal and Burkina Faso, two in East Africa, that's Ethiopia and Tanzania, and then two in Southeast Asia, which is Cambodia and Bangladesh. And so we have different value chains that we're targeting within those countries. We have different practices being used, but they all apply back to that concept of, you know, sustainably creating agriculture production without, you know, causing more um, stress on the resources that we already have limitations to. So what are some examples of projects that you're working on in one of these countries? So um, I personally am not engaged per se on a, a given project. So that's the other thing about Innovation Labs is that, it's, you know, Kansas State is the management entity of the Sustainable Intensification Innovation Lab or the Sorghum and Mill Innovation Lab. But as part of that, there's sub awards in which we have given to different institutions in order to conduct research. So we're involved in the research, but not I'm not necessarily a lead on, say, a given project or a co-PI on a given project. Um, and so some examples of what we are doing, though, is we have projects in uh, Senegal that are really looking at integrated crop livestock systems and how can you use sort of resource recycling in those systems and what are the major you know, opportunities or constraints within that type of a system. Uh, in Cambodia, we are focusing on horticulture production from um, a smallholder perspective. So women are really engaged in vegetable production in the country of Cambodia. And that project is specifically working with women to see how, you know, if you engage women in, in a project, does that then you know, increase their knowledge and capabilities and the resources that they have to to be stakeholders within a, a given value chain. And so that project is really looking at can we use conservation ag practices on vegetable farms and then engage women in order to see if that has any impact on on the sustainability as well as the production level of vegetables there. And, and we have lots of others, <laughs> and, but I think that I, like I said, not being super intimately involved in some of those projects, it's hard for me to kind of comment ex exactly on all of them. Sure. So, uh, so since you're involved with a lot of the projects, mm -hmm. what are some of the, the biggest challenges that you, that you see and, and what are some of the ways that people are going about trying to solve them? So, you know, I think from my perspective personally, there's a few major challenges that I think we face from different levels. And so I want to start off by sort of highlighting the challenge of conducting research 
in in a developing nation context because it's not as straightforward as as we think about research here at Kansas State, right? So if to put it very much in my realm, if if I wanted to do a project to look at the prevalence of salmonella in a certain product in the United States, it'd be pretty straightforward for me to to do that, right? We have the lab capacity for it. We have the student workforce for it. We have the compliance office that is here to support us in all of that. And, and so you have from an administrative perspective all the way down to undergraduate help, you have the, the modalities for that. We spend a lot of time working on capacity development from a research perspective. And, and that becomes a lot more dynamic than it sounds because you begin to start having conversations like, okay, there is no governing board for biosecurity levels in the whole country, but I need to make sure that I'm bringing good practices in and that I'm not teaching students that it's okay to throw pathogens in the trash, right? right? And so you still want to be able to create that capacity, but you sort of have to do it without your common... Right, without the infrastructure. Infrastructure. And so that's definitely a challenge. And I think the more we move into some of these research areas such as food safety or even vet medicine, um, where some of those those laboratories become a little bit not as straightforward as, as say, doing some agronomic work where you, you kind of have the land space and you can do some of those trials. It does become more interesting to begin to say, okay, how do we not only bring research projects into wherever it is that we're working, but how do we also, you know, create that capacity so that when the project's over, our partners have that sustainability in what's happening. I think, so from a second perspective, trust. And, and I think that everybody kind of box at me a little bit when I kind of go into this, but I'm learning more and more that research and collaboration is very much based on mutual trust. And and whether or not you and your collaborator recognize that that you're both there to support and to help in that situation and I do think in development work we need to be really conscientious about creating the same types of trust and collaboration that we would with any U.S. based partner that we would would engage with and there tends to be some challenges in some of that because you have to spend a little bit more time than you than you naturally would so it takes time for someone to go, okay, yes, I believe that, that you're here to help support me and that, that we're going to work collaborati- collaboratively on this. And so that might mean a few more trips to Cambodia than you had anticipated so that you can build that trust and your partners do feel like you're there to partner with them and, and be engaged for the long term and not just sort of show up, say, here – Here's a project, here's some funding, and we, we need the final report by August. You know, I think that spending time on the ground is really, really valuable. And, and that can be a challenging thing from a, a you know, trying to manage a, a position within your home institution in the U.S. And, and also trying to really create that level of trust with your partners in other countries. Um, from a from a food systems perspective, we are lagging behind in research, uh, specifically for animal source foods. So it's it's challenging to do, say, like a livestock feeding trial in in some of these countries that we work in because where do you find thirty similar cows mm-hmm. to put on a, a feeding trial mm-hmm. that you can you know do all the randomization that you need and the right. blocking that you need to make sure and that you're enough actually, control of all the other variables absolutely. right absolutely yeah. and again like i said um and not to suggest that agronomic data is super straightforward to collect but you you can't con- you don't necessarily have the same um challenges in saying okay you know we we're going to take some of these fields and get some people engaged and we'll do some trials from an agronomy perspective livestock's a much more challenging resource to find and people tend to in developing nations look at livestock as somewhat of like a um kind of a walking 
bank, right? So yeah. they're valuable. Right. Yeah. And and so they're a little less likely to be like, sure, take my cow right. because no, I need that cow because if something happens, I know I can take that cow and sell her for eight hundred dollars in comparison to the, you know, maybe couple, you know, twenty, thirty dollars I'll get for a few bushels of wheat. And so I'm not going to just kind of throw her around to anyone who's asking for her. And so so that would be one area. And then I think as we move more into issues of like food safety, vet medicine, um, that those are those are under researched areas in developing nations. So I've got a lot of questions about this, but um, one of them is related to this bit about trust. And sort of one of the one of the things that you highlighted there is that uh, um, you don't always necessarily have the same goals, right? So there's other Absolutely. things, right? Sort of you know you, you want to study and learn something, right? Uh, but um, but other people have to be worrying about other things, right? Sort of as they're being right involved in the study, right? So uh, like, can you say more about sort of how you negotiate that and sort of you know that there's I mean this happens in a lot of research, right? Sort of uh, human subjects research mm-hmm. is sort of sometimes like this, right? Sort of uh, you want to learn something, but you have to ensure that you know you're taking care of the patient, right? And that the patient's health is coming first, right? Uh, right. And you know sometimes those come apart a little bit, right? You know uh, you know. It, Geez, it would be really neat if we could learn this thing, but we'd have to put people at risk, so we're not going to do that, right? Uh, uh, could you like highlight some other ways that, like, some ways that happens in the kind of research you're talking about? Yeah, so I think a really good example that we had happen is we work pretty significantly in Ethiopia, and that's a country where I have several projects happening, and it's that country is very near and dear to my heart. Um, but it has definitely had some challenges in the last few years from a safety perspective, just because there, there's some differences in opinion from a political standpoint. And so it's really been challenged in trying to create cohesiveness from a full population level. And so you kind of get into these situations where you begin to start asking, okay, well, it's not super safe currently to just be traveling around the country. Um, we do have research sites in all these different places because that's how rigorous data is collected, right? We, we do some sampling here and there, and, and that's how we're able to you know, have our random sample that's hopefully indicative of the whole population. But I'm working you know, with a certain region and it's not necessarily safe for them to go into another region at this point in time. And so you begin to start saying, okay, so what's the right thing to do? Is it to try to hold off on our timelines? Or do we need to try to stick to our timelines? And, and sometimes as a scientist, that's hard, right? Because you want to say, no, I've been trained to. I want to do it based upon the timelines that we've identified. This is the proposal we turned in. These are the documents that we're being held accountable for. And we have to stick to these things. But at the same time, you kind of get into this place where it's like, but I'm not going to risk you know, the health of, of my colleagues or put them in a position that makes them super uncomfortable to make sure that we stick to our timelines. Because I'll tell you one thing that doesn't translate to Ethiopia very well from a cultural perspective is just timelines. They are, I mean, they've got this common phrase they say is chigrelum, which means no problem. And they, they kind of live in this space of it's okay if this doesn't happen exactly now or exactly how we said it would because we'll get there it's going to happen and in the U.S. we tend to not think that way at all it's no you said this was going to happen today at two o'clock and it's 205 and it hasn't happened and so (laughs) so you know there's a big learning lesson for me in that which is that I am even if I am the lead of a project I am there as a support team member to the in-country institutions because because that is how it it needs to be because if we want to see development in the ways that we want to see it it needs to be my in-country colleagues who are really you know gaining the opportunities and so i can't just drive that point and drive over them in order to make sure that I'm keeping to, say, a U.S.-based timeline right. that I think is really important. 
And, and so that's kind of one example that we've particularly had to manage. And I've just had to kind of learn to take some deep breaths on things and learn how to just be honest in, in reports and say to our funding group, you know, this is happening. We're managing it to the best that we can. And these are the strategies we're using to manage this. But we're in a situation where our colleagues really should not be visiting that research site at this time. And we can't tell you when that's going to get better. And it's going to depend upon all of these factors that we can't control. And, and sorry. <laughs> do you think funding agencies recognize the, the challenge of doing research do. internationally like this? So they, they're yeah. understandable of these issues. I yeah. do. I, you know, so we work with both USAID and USDA um, FAS. And they are, in my opinion, really easy to work with from that perspective. They're, they're very uh, willing to, to say, okay, you know, we work in this space too. We understand the, the challenges of doing research in environments where you can't control all the parameters. And you know, we, just need, we just need you to write us up a paragraph that tells us what, what is happening and we can, we can support you as we move forward. That's great. Does that come from experience in the past where they have tried to really control things and it's just resulted in a collapse of projects completely? Or I think that there's a lot of um, lessons that have been learned from a development, research for development context. And, and I mean, and just a natural development context. And if you look into development research and work that's being done, there is a, a evolution that is really beginning to happen where, you know, maybe in the past we haven't really considered too much from a, from a truly agricultural productivity research standpoint. We haven't stepped back and said, well, how does human nutrition uh, impact that? How does, you know, the role of gender influence some of the outcomes? How does the role of, of climate and resources and economics and I think that that's the, if you look at the types of projects that are being funded across the board from a development standpoint, those are all becoming factors that they want you to address. That, hey, we're, we're not really interested in you just testing X, Y, and Z varieties of wheat. We also want to know whether or not that's appropriate for the people who are looking to use it, whether or not it's appropriate for the community or the country in general. And does it does it have any impact on health or on social dynamics, cultural dynamics? So I do think the development has kind of done a trial, error, look back, adjust, trial, error, look back, adjust approach to how they've moved forward um, from a research standpoint. Yeah, it's, it's not all just about, uh, in fact, a lot of the issues have nothing to do with the particular variety of wheat or whatever Usually right not. sort of right <laughs> there there's social and economic mm -hmm. and right you know all these other things yeah so so what are the major things that you I mean, you, you mentioned a bunch of things but sort of the in the difficulty of doing some of the research but what do you most want to learn uh in in some of these areas that you're working in Oh, that's such a good question. Well, so, you know, my interest always comes back to more of a public health perspective. And, and I do think, and there is a lot of movement currently happening from that side, right? So what does this all mean for human nutrition? What does it mean for enteric disease? What does it mean for child development? Um, so that's very much happening. Something I want to learn and would love to see become you know, a major part of what we are looking to do in development is how do we create better food safety systems that are contextually appropriate, right? So not just saying, well, here's how we do food safety in the European Union. Here's how we do food safety in the U.S. Plug this in. It'll work. That's currently happening. And it doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding, right? right. <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> right. You look into, I mean, I can go right now to the Ministry of Ag or the Ministry of Health for any given country in Africa and find a pretty well thought out food safety program. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that they don't have the full intention of actually right, making sure. that happen. They just, at this point in time, don't have the capacity from several levels, from a agriculture production uh, perspective, from a ministry and governance perspective. And from a private industry perspective, you just don't have the same system. And so for me, I would really love to learn how do you do that? 
um, what are some of the things that do translate quite well, and then how do we kind of take the things that translate, move them into other countries, other regions, and and start start to see that grow. And I I think that that is going to be a lot of what I will hopefully spend most of my life doing. <laughs> we'll see. So how do you measure progress on things mm-hmm. like this, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, you're talking about very big things, big social problems and that sort of thing. What are some ways in which uh, you guys assess that you're, you are moving forward? Number one lesson of my career, and, and it was a hard-learned lesson. Uh, you cannot uh, focus on some of these big, big things that you think you want to focus on, right? So I think when I was being trained and coming up through my PhD, right, I measured progress very differently. And so you kind of want to see all of a sudden a new food safety program happening in a given country. And you you want to see people engaging in that. And you don't want there to be corruption. And you don't want there to be, <laughs> you know, all of these things that play into um, why certain food safety programs are not successful and it's that's just not going to necessarily happen probably even necessarily in my timeline and I always think of Norman Borlaug a little bit right because I don't think that he, I think he knew that he had an influence but I don't think that he recognized in his lifetime the impact that his research really would ultimately have and, and so I think focusing on some of those big things is just maddening. And so from my perspective, the progress that I tend to try to measure is things like, and again, I, I know that I'm kind of moving back into social perspectives, but, you know, does the university that I'm working with in a given country have higher laboratory capacity than when I started? Are my colleagues in you know whatever country I'm working with gaining more access to publications gaining more access to attending international meetings where they'll benefit from the conversations that are happening you know it has to be those things because those are those are the most tangible things that are in front of you at that time and you know we may be doing some really great stuff that 10 years from now will come into fruition the challenge is, is that there's this whole value chain that needs to occur, right? So we might produce the data, you know, now. I mean, one of the big things that we're seeking to do is there's very little data on just, you know, what is within, from a pa- bacterial pathogen standpoint, within a vegetable value chain, within a meat value chain for a given country. And then, you know, how do we create good surveillance programs? You know, that's, we're very in the, much in the grassroots of a lot of that. And so, that information may be taken up 10 years from now, the right governance is, is applied, and then things start to move. But that's 10 years from now. And so I think for me, progress has to be measured in these small things, particularly students. You know, I mean, students, and I'm going to maybe get a little bit, you know, emotional because the students that we're engaging in in some of these countries are just so wonderful. They are so excited to be given the opportunity to engage in in the research and to meet someone that's outside of their culture and to try to understand something that, you know, that is is new and fresh and they're just motivated beyond belief to show up, right? They'll show up on a Saturday. They'll show up on a Sunday. They don't care. They want to be there for it. And, And so for me, it's like, great, we're training, you know, so we have a project in Cambodia where we're working on laboratory capacity with the Royal University of Agriculture. And we have about 25 undergraduate students that have showed up to absolutely every sample collection that we do, every lab day that we've done. And I know that we're going to leave that uh, project and there's going to be this whole group of undergraduate students who you know, without the project may have had access to all of that, but may not. And, and I know that as I leave that, that, that they did and, and that I learned a lot from them in that process. And my graduate students learned a lot from them. And, and we, we, I hopefully bestowed a lot of information and, and, um, you know, talents or sorry, skills is the right word that they can use. 
Grat- gratitude can be a pretty powerful thing, right? I mean, it's something yeah. we kind of take for granted maybe in the U.S. where access to education and resources is uh, you know, much more ubiquitous and easy, right? There is definitely a level of gratitude that you can witness in a very big way in a lot of the work that we do. And I, and I do think, you know, I, I think our poor students sometimes get a bad rap. But they, you know, I think that there's a lot of gratitude to be had in the U.S. Mm-hmm. too. Sure. Um, and, you know, and part of that is we, you know, I just got back from Ethiopia and I had taken an undergraduate student with me that had shown lots of interest from the first time she showed up on campus. And, um, you know, she'd written me this, this thank you letter and so i you know i think that that's that's kind of the two hinge part of the gratitude right so i think there's a lot of students here at kansas state that would be very grateful for the opportunity to go somewhere like ethiopia or bangladesh and and not just go to tour around and see but go and sit in on the meetings and and conduct the research and be a part of that and then the students in those those institutions within the countries we're working in are very grateful for the opportunity to work with those young people because they see right. I mean, it's really easy to look across at someone that's the same age as you and who is similar to you and have this really rich interaction versus you know me and a, and a young student. There's a, you know we kind of get into a little bit of this. You know, you, well you're you know, you're a doctor and I'm, I'm just an undergraduate student. And so there's not maybe necessarily that same level of camaraderie in it. And so I really do believe in, in sort of taking students with me and, and giving students there that opportunity to, to interact with a student from Kansas State because it's a really powerful thing. So you said you mentioned that you do have graduate students. Things. I How do. do you do you have a sort of a structured approach that you take to to including them in that sort of thing, or uh, or, or do you just kind of is it just kind of project dependent? Sort of? <laughs> I think that they would probably suggest that I don't have very much structure to anything that I do. <laughs> I uh, am I'm one of those professors who's super lucky because I have two students that are just. Wonderful, and so might as well just give a shout out to them right here, right now. They're they're both wonderful. Um, I would say that what I, the approach I took was that I needed students to be engaged in these projects that I have um, in a way that I felt they could sort of take forward some of the research, right? So that I wasn't focusing much on, you know, on the ground you know, sample collection methods, those types of, of things, even though I, I mean, I'm, I try to be as heavily engaged as, as I possibly can. I also really wanted to provide an opportunity for the two of them to, to begin to start connecting the dots in a lot bigger way. So I'm a really big believer in critical thinking. My trainers my trainers, my advisors, <laughs> they're kind of my trainers, but <laughs> my advisors were big on that as well, right? It's not just about here's the research, here's how I did it, these were the findings, but then how does that fit into the greater concepts that exist? And so I really wanted them to have an opportunity to not only be trained technically well um, in food microbiology, but to also have a chance to go and be in a country for periods of time. And so, you know, they've gone and they've spent a month before, they've spent, you know, a couple weeks here and there they've made several trips they've made relationships and so I think that they're starting to really see how what they're doing in in the lab really translates back to some of the bigger questions that we have from a development context and and so I don't know if I I think maybe I went off a little bit from what your question was asking but so I've kind of had a twofold if if you will so they are they do train in a lab they know how to do, you know, all the, the food you gotta, micro you gotta stuff. got to have the basics, right? Yeah. Um, but they've been asked to do it in this very uncontrolled environment. And the two of them have just exceeded my expectations. They've gone in to a lab that didn't have anything in it. And they've made it this functional lab that has pipettes and 
vortexes and all all the cool lab stuff and and that's all based upon the, their hard work and effort and i couldn't be prouder of the two of them they're just fantastic very cool nice job graduate students yeah. <laughs> keep up the good work <laughs> <laughs> yes and and if you know any great graduate students uh that are highly motivated we'd love to take them on so <laughs> excellent Sounds good. Um, well, we want to be respectful of your time, but uh, are there are, is there anything else that you think that, that people should know about the, the kind of work that you're doing, or the, 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 they may not understand uh, that you would like to like to a topic you'd like to approach? Well, I, so I always talk about bidirectional learning, and I think that it's an important piece to what we do, and and sometimes I do think it gets a little bit forgotten, but there's a lot that we can learn from the research that we're doing. And sometimes I get into conversations where people um, tend to, you know, not, not necessarily wrongfully think, but think that, you know, Kansas State is taking these researchers to Cambodia, to Ethiopia, and providing. Right, we're bringing information. We're right. bringing we're information. Bringing knowledge, yeah. And we absolutely are. But there's a lot of really highly trained people, um, technically savvy people that we're working with all the time. And we learn a lot from those endeavors. And, and I do think that a lot of the research that we are seeking to do doesn't just answer questions for Cambodia. It answers questions for Cambodia, but it also, I think, gives insights into how does that translate into something that's powerful for the United States or something that's powerful for for the European right, Union. So I think particularly from a food safety perspective, right, the more we understand about, you know, foodborne pathogens um, throughout the world, the more we understand how those pathogens move and, and end up transmitted. And so, you know, there's a trade issue, there's a public health issue there, and that doesn't just, that, you know, that's not a border controlled concept. That concept, it impacts all of us. And so, and I think there's a lot of examples of that throughout the Feed the Future programs is how do we do research that definitely supports development, helps, you know, move people along, but is super important for just global food production and global health. And, and I think that that's been a mission of mine all along the way is, you know, how do I do things that help me learn and grow and and hopefully I'm engaging with colleagues that that see you know want to do that with me. And I think we've been very lucky to you know we've got such great collaborators around the world, really intellectual and interesting people who help me see the world in in a whole different light. And I I feel like I've grown, you know, ten years in the last three. Because I've had these opportunities to sit across from these super wise people who understand things differently. And yeah. So how much of that is the different context, the different mm -hmm. uh, different problems that they've been dealing with, or sort of you know the different infrastructural context, right? So for the food Absolutely. safety bit, like we've got all this, as you said, infrastructure. So mm -hmm. they're they've been investigating other ways of, of of handling some of the same issues. Is it is it is it a lot of that? Right? Yeah. You know, I think that, and honestly. There's a lot of nations around the world that have issues that are threats to the United States. Right. And, we, and we are lucky, uh, and not lucky, because we've got great people working on the safety of our food supply and our animal supply mm -hmm. and our you know, grain supply. And so, you know, that's not just happening. It's not just a coincidence. But, you know, there's definitely... So, you know, I always use the example of foot and mouth disease. You know, we are, we've, we've had really great strategies to keeping that out of of us but it's always there it's always a risk and there's a lot of nations around the world that that's they deal with it all the time right foot and mouth disease is is a disease that exists within their country and they're having to manage it and so there's, so there's a, a lot we can learn there's a lot we can learn and i always use the example um you know the sorghum and millet innovation lab actually got to be involved in engaged in something very similar to that um, you know, based on the great work that they're doing, there was a, a pest, an insect that came into the U.S. Maybe, I, see, I'm going to get the story yeah. wrong, but, <laughs> um, you know, that came into the U.S. It had never been here before. It was a very serious threat to sorghum production. 
And, you know, one of the researchers here at K-State was just happened to be engaged with with researchers that knew all about it and they were able to get ahead of it and and do the you know the appropriate steps to try and manage that for you know sorghum producers in the united states and and that was because of of a collaboration that was because of mutual trust and and this hard work that this sorghum and millet innovation lab and and a kansas state researcher had put in and so we're learning things all the time that's, that's that very help. cool. Yeah. That help us. So the message is partly, uh, hey, there, there are a lot of issues we all have, we all share, we have to work together to address, right? And and there are collective global problems, right? But also absolutely. then the knowledge is, you know, it's going to take all of us, right? So there's, there's, yeah, absolutely. It's not just us saving the world, obviously, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I, you know, I, I mean, I do, I just think that there's such a value to, from, particularly from a food perspective, to really understanding how food moves and the challenges to food production around the world, because we're not going to be able to to not participate in the the challenges that are in front of us, and and I do think that those challenges have been fairly well characterized at this point in time, and so and I do I think Kansas State researchers agree i think we were excited to be engaged in in research that's help, helping to overcome some of those challenges or or fill gaps and you know the more people that we can engage with in different spaces and different nations around the world it just it helps the world it helps kansas it, you know it helps us all individually and so i'm i'm a big believer in in the research that we are doing and and the activities that that are happening Excellent. So I have to ask: Is there ever has there been any uh, like amazing food that you've been exposed to uh, around <laughs> yes. the world that you wouldn't have otherwise been? I'm a foodie, yeah. first of all. <laughs> so you have to understand that about me. Sure. So um, I love Southeast Asian food, and um, <laughs> there's so there's this great quote by Anthony Bourdain about how you know he was meant to slurp noodles out of a bowl sitting in a colorful plastic chair <laughs> in southeast asia and i couldn't agree more yeah. i i just i think southeast asian food is really fantastic and it's dynamic and 9 times out of 10 there's a head involved but you know i've grown to kind <laughs> of like get past some of that stuff and and really recognize like particularly asia just the spices and the types of ingredients that are available to them are really just dynamic and beautiful. And, and I love food anyways and would describe food as beautiful, but their food is particularly beautiful in the, the context of, of all foods. Yeah, it's important to remember right, that it's perspective, right? The, yeah. you know, a head on a plate or something is, is normal to, to some cultures uh, for their food system. Well, so, and I yeah. think that, so this well, this could be a, po- a whole podcast of itself, <laughs> yeah. but I do think it's also interesting to begin to start to look at, you know, how do people eat around the world? And it's sure. it's definitely different, and there's no better or, or wrong way but there's definitely differences in how people eat. It was funny. We had some Cambodians who came to visit, and they're always treating me to just beautiful food. And I tried. I really did <laughs> um, to just try and find some foods that, that I thought would be fun. And they were super gracious and tried absolutely everything. But by the end of the trip, um, they were interested in maybe getting some Thai food or something <laughs> that, you know, in some way looked like home. And I think that that's kind of one of the most, more beautiful things about food is that we, we kind of want to put it in the sciences production perspective all the time. And there's just such a beautiful emotional connection, I think, with food that everybody has, whether they want to admit it or not. You know, there's, there's something about home in in the foods that we eat and the foods that we like and foods can take us to such a place and a memory and and i think that that's a special thing about food which is why i believe in in producing it and and saving you know keeping it safe and and making sure that people all people have access to it because i think that's a beautiful part of human existence is is that you get to share in food and food consumption 
it occurs to me, I wonder how much sort of sometimes food safety seems to me to work against the beauty of food, oh, right? You be. know, yeah. uh, <laughs> right? And the art of cooking. And yeah. right? uh, so how much of the way the way you were just talking about food there and, you know, being so focused on food safety is, mm-hmm. is kind of curious, right? Uh, in a sense, because they're, they're two very different ways of approaching food, right? right. Uh, and then it, and internationally, I imagine... Um, some of the recommendations, some of the food safety recommendations might not play out nearly as well as they would sort of maybe here where we're more used to hearing certain kinds of recommendations, mm-hmm. right? You know, oh, don't eat food, you know, unless it's been cooked to a certain amount or, you know, whatever, right? right uh, yeah. So how does that play out, do you think, in, in your work? So, I mean, I have several food safety friends who love oysters, and they're just always going to love oysters, yeah. raw oysters. Yeah, to be more I do too. I love them, yeah. And I personally, I mean, I think it feels like swallowing a loogie a little yeah. bit. <laughs> um, so I don't have nearly that yeah. that personal connection with raw oysters, but they love raw oysters. Yeah. And I think that that people can tend to think that food safety is more about the do's and the don'ts. Mm-hmm. But for me, you know, I think food safety is a really dynamic discipline. And there's always a risk to be calculated. Right. And so I think nothing is entirely risk free. Nothing's risk free. And I think that individual people can kind of calculate that risk for themselves. And so for me, I always tell, you know, people that, hey, I'm a pretty good risk assessor. And so there's certain foods that I know probably I have a high likelihood of vomiting and I don't like to vomit. Now, my friend, (laughs) my friend Dave um, he seems to not worry that much about vomiting. He kind of can push through it and he would rather eat the street Whatever, food. Right? Yeah. It's valuable to him. Um, now does that change the science around it? No. I mean, he's definitely a public health stat. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, we're going to keep, we're going to put him in yeah. the number of foodborne diseases. Yeah. But at this point in his life, you know, he is young, he's healthy. Um, he doesn't have, you know, any, you know, immunocompromised disease, you know, or he's not immunocompromised. And so he vomits and that's about it. Now, as he gets older, he might want to think think about that differently. Right. Sure. Right. And so I think that people tend to kind of think about food safety as, as that we're like the people who are there to say, no, you don't get to do anything fun versus can we take what we know? to apply strategic interventions to a value chain to try to make it as safe as possible. We can't make, there's no such thing as 0% in food safety, but we can make it as safe as we possibly can. And then what do, what's the role and responsibility of consumers in their decision making? And so, you know, I think we've got a lot of great science that can help us get to that food value chain and safe food value chains perspective. And then education extension programs that can help consumers think through what is their risks associated. And then I think there is a part of it where you sometimes you end up vomiting. <laughs> and, <laughs> and particularly if you're going to eat you know, street food. But, but you know, maybe sometimes that, it's worth it. Well, weigh that risk <laughs> a little bit. And I, I by no means am, you know, cheering anyone on in that area. As a, I think as a food safety scientist, of I course. would suggest, you know, Maybe don't, don't do this at necessarily home, eat. Yeah, don't do this at home. <laughs> I, I'm not a big believer in like swallowing raw eggs and things like that. But <laughs> then again, like I said, I've got lots of, you know, epidemiologists, food microbiologists, food safety scientists around me that eat things like raw oysters and tartar. And they just say, hey, I've assessed the risk and I don't, I'm not that worried about it. Um, and just one one last question that I have for you that's sort of off topic, but uh, one thing I've heard uh, a lot is that uh, there are foreign corporate entities that are investing a lot in agriculture in developing countries. Is that something you've seen at all in the countries you've worked in or no? So which which companies are you maybe Well, not suggesting? even necessarily like agrochemical companies or anything like that, but like uh, wealthy individuals buying up large tracts of land, mm-hmm. um, you know, whether they be from China or I know Brazil is investing mm-hmm. a lot in, mm-hmm. South, in Southern Africa uh, as a way of providing possibly another source of food for their own home country. Mm-hmm. Uh, is that anything that you've, you've witnessed or not really? So, yeah, I mean, to some degree in m- most countries, you know, even our own, you can see things like that happening where, you know, there's invest- foreign investment occurring um 
And I mean, I think that there's someone wiser to comment on some of those issues than me. What I think uh, is very valuable from a global food systems perspective is that we try to manage equity as best as we possibly can. And equity is always a, a huge question in lots of different areas, right? Um, and equity is different than equality a little bit, you know? And so we're, we're looking at how do we kind of help support certain groups so that they have the advantages that are maybe afforded to other groups. And, and so for me, I think that there always has to be a question of equity involved in, in the things that we're doing. And I do think that there's a lot of private industry investment that's seeking to do things like that. So I think that Land O'Lakes would be a really good example of that. They have obviously their, you know, products that they produce that they have interest in, but there's also this really cool research arm that they have that has a development perspective to it. And they're doing some really great things, particularly in East Africa, looking at milk and, and kind of butter production and some of those things. And, and you know, one of the questions that they commonly ask in, in the research that they're doing is, you know, how do we help create opportunity? for for the people that that we're working with and around and so I, I guess that that's where I will I will come down on that as I think that no matter who the development group is whether it's research whether it's private industry whether it's government um, NGOs which w- would be non-government organizations um, you know that we kind of always have to go back to that question of equity and and are we engaging in a way that helps everyone get involved part of the capacity building we were talking about before right? absolutely and yeah. private industry and i know i'm just talking 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 but private no this is great <laughs> <laughs> private industry has a huge role to play and it's a very unengaged not necessarily from because they don't want to be engaged but i think that there's been a lot of challenge in identifying how private industry can engage in some of the development that's happening and, you know, where's the benefit for both sides in that? And and so, you know, there's a lot of discussion around, you know, does it make sense for private industry that already exists in places like Brazil or the United States, European Union, to go and engage there? Or does it make sense to kind of try to do some gra- grassroots entrepreneurship, um, particularly with youth? There's a lot of discussion around youth entrepreneurship in in different contexts to create that private industry and depending upon who you are i think you think differently about both those those two sides but from my perspective it's it's a underdeveloped part of development it's super necessary and if there's anyone from private industry listening i think that you know, take a look. <laughs> <laughs> lots of opportunities. There's yeah. lots of opportunities yeah. there. And there are lots of young people in some of the, the different countries that we work in who are really energetic, motivated, bright people. And they don't have the opportunities that are that are as available in the United States. And so I think you would find a workforce that is super excited to to get an opportunity great oh, well we uh, we certainly appreciate you taking the time to to talk to us is there uh, any way people can get in contact with you that you would like to share or where they can find more information sure mm-hmm. yeah i mean <laughs> be, be careful i mean you don't have to sort of give your email address or anything like that but <laughs> well what i will say is is that kansas state you know is is highly engaged in this conversation i think that from a all the way up from an administrative side down to a researcher side down to a student side um we have people who are really excited to do these types of of activities and that if you want to look into what the innovation labs are doing as well as just what individuals at kansas state are doing um there's a lot of of cool stuff happening a lot of great researchers that are, are doing really important, robust science in this area. 
And I couldn't be prouder to be involved in Kansas State's efforts here because I think that that it's a a exciting new frontier that Kansas State has decided to engage in. So please look into what what Kansas State is doing from a global food systems development uh, perspective. Great. Well, thanks, Jesse, right. so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. This was really fun. Okay. <laughs> If you have any questions or comments you'd like to share, drop us an email or check out our website at kstate.edu backslash research backslash global food. Something to Chew On is produced by the Office of Research Development at Kansas State University.